So frame of mind, you have to sort of reframe how you think of these things. Exam day and prep, get a good night's rest. Easy to say, hard to do. Protein breakfast is good because if you eat just carbs, you'll, you'll raise your sugar up, then you'll spike your insulin, then you'll get hypoglycemic. You get hypoglycemic, you don't function as well. So eggs, juice, uh, maybe some yogurt, not too much caffeine, not super sugary juice. Uh, if you usually take caffeine, take caffeine because if you don't, you will get caffeine withdrawal headaches. Dress comfortably, arrive 30 minutes before appointment time because things always get screwed up. Use the bathroom before testing. You can take breaks when you're given the opportunity, but sometimes uh, it's a block of time and it counts against your time. And so it'd be better off to not spend your time doing that. Don't eat too much or too little, especially don't carb load at lunch unless you're going to run a marathon instead of come back and take the second half of the exam because carb loading will make you sleepy. So mind the distractors. I told you about this. Is like you go through the, the distractors are all the wrong answers and it's what test I, item writers spend most of their time thinking of. So um, the wrong answers, you want to look each of those up and find out what they do. So I gave you the example of the most typical cause of peripheral neuropathy is diabetes. But I want to know about the rest of these things. So B6, what does it do? It causes a pure sensory neuropathy. What does, anab- what does metronidazole do? Um, it causes an ant abuse effect, and it can cause a peripheral neuropathy. Cephalosporins, what are the side effects of that? They have 4 to 10% cross-allergenicity with penicillins, but they can also cause an interstitial nephritis. What do, you, what do you need to know about Wilson's disease? Kaiser Flesher ring, liver problems, and dementia. Copper toxicity. Next year's version might be, which of these causes peripheral neuropathy? So last year's version was, which of these is the most common cause? But then if I've mined the distractor, I have a map of the territory, and I know that they might ask a peripheral neuropathy question, and that's one of the things that they consider valid knowledge. So internal cueing, opposites of one or the other are often true, like right versus left or left versus right, unless they're equal, and then it would just be a trick. Longer and more precise answer, most often correct. More choices um, of a single drug at different doses, often one of those will be correct. Um, Choice of facts, true. So A plus B, A plus C, B plus C, B plus D, just D more likely to be uh, one of the first four and not a single one because they wouldn't have combinations in there. So these are all of the things that give you like an extra 1% or 2% advantage. And um, I will always take something that will give me a 1% or 2% advantage. External cueing. One question gives the answer to another. The board has several versions of questions on a particular item, and they sort of assign them randomly. So you might get three questions on hypothyroidism, and one of them might, answer the, might give you the answer to the other two. So if someone gives you a gift, say thank you. Um, there may, they may randomize you two or three on the same subject. The stem of one may give you the answer to another. If you think this is the case, use your whiteboard to write out the data or question numbers and mark them and go back and forth. So you're not allowed to take permanent notes, but usually you get like a marker and a whiteboard. So you can go back and forth between those questions and look at them. Test anxiety, uh, two folks, Ramirez and Bayak, did a, a test with fearful students, and they found out that they did better if they jotted down their worries. If you write about your worries for 10 minutes, it allows your brain to sort of put them off to the side and like, okay, those are taken care of, rather than they go around and around in your brain all the time and cause anxiety. So I call that go from choking to smoking if you write down your test-related worries before you take a major exam. It dislodges concerns and clears the way for higher achievement. Now this we're going to talk about a little bit. This is Daniel Kahneman's work called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. He was actually given a Nobel Prize for this. So he talks about two systems that the brain has. They're not anatomically distinct systems. They're not firing networks. They're just two modes the brain has. System one is what the brain wants to be in and what it defaults to. It operates automatically and quickly and has little voluntary control. So if you say, what's two plus two? Four. You recognize somebody who's hostile coming at you. You don't have to like, sit around and think of that because if you, if you were in the group that had to sit around and think if somebody who was hostile was coming at you, your genes did not make it from generation to generation. <laughs> um, so you can drive a car on an empty road. You recognize stereotypes. System two is the engaged thing. It allocates attention to effortful mental activities that demand it. Complex computations, choice and concentration, finding a person in a crowd, filling out tax forms, checking the validity of a complex argument, and walking faster than your norm. So here's here's a couple of Kahneman things. So a bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So 
answer that comes to mind is 10 cents. The answer evoked intuitively and is appealing, um, but it is wrong. More than 50% of stu students at Harvard, Princeton, and MIT gave the wrong answer. So these are pretty smart folks. Either that or they're well-connected. But we're talking about the smart ones here. <laughs> so it's safe to assume that those who gave the correct answer also had the initial intuitive incorrect answer and managed to resist that intuition. So if you do the formula, you say x plus y equals $1.10, x minus y equals $1. So then 2x is 2.10, so it, x is $1.05, then y a dollar five minus y is a dollar, so y is five cents. So system one is involved, the, the conclusion comes first and the argument follows. So the things you want to do during your exam is you want to be able to turn on system two and think about things rather than just answer reflexively. So if it takes five machines five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? A hundred minutes or five minutes? It would take five minutes. If, if um, a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 hours for the patch to cover the lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? 48 days. It would take 47, uh, it would take, it would take um, 47 days because the last um, day it doubles in size. And so it would cover the lake, um, it would cover the, half the lake in 47 days and then the next day it would double to 48. So... 40 Princeton students did the two questions above. If the font was washed out, fuzzy, or hard to read, 90% of them got it correct because they had to think, they had to concentrate, they had to get out of their normal mode. If the font was clear, crisp, and easy, 35% of them got them both wrong. So effort engages system two, and system one is often the default. Your brain wants to use less oxygen, less, less glucose. It wants to save and just go to that resting mode. So your brain would like to sit on the couch even if your body wants to be out walking around. If system one is involved, the conclusion comes first. The application of system two requires effort and some distress being engaged. System two in on mode is more alert, more intellectually active, and less satisfied with superficially attractive answers. It's more skeptical about just intuitive responses. And that's how you smell, taste, feel the right answers rather than just answer what they're trying to get suckered into. So most people speak at 135 to 175 words a minute, but the mind is capable of processing 400 to 500 words a minute. That's why I talk fast, also because I'm from the East. Um, but if you, uh, the time gradient between the, the rate people speak and the way they process allows for dis distraction of the listener. Conscious effort is required to stay at a slower speed and impairs processing. Higher speeds or slower speeds, require focus and improve comprehension and processing. So anything that's outside the normal range makes you process it in a different way. That's true if you have an accent. It's true if you're bubbling underwater. That's me doing Tai Chi on the Great Wall of China. Um, so we're going to end section one.